the reality is, in many respects today, life sciences companies aren't selling products. Everything they're doing is selling a service. Hello, and welcome to episode nine of the Reagent Podcast. Today's show is brought to you by One Point Solutions, the leader in US lab design and construction. My guest this week is Matt Wilkinson. Matt has a PhD in chemistry, as well as his MBA. He led a company-wide e-commerce transformation at LGC and is now primarily a business consultant for life science and pharmaceutical firms. We talk about leadership, communication, and organizational change in the sciences. Here's my interview with Matt. So thanks for taking the time and and thanks for hopping on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's It's a pleasure to be here, Matt. For sure. How's your week going so far? It's been busy, which is just the way I like it. Same here, same here. Um, so I figured I'd jump right into it. Um, I'm really curious to hear about your background. So after you completed your PhD at the University of Bristol, you headed right into research in Amsterdam. Um, can you walk me through what that decision was like? I'm really curious to hear about what your options were at the time, like someone who had just gotten a PhD. Um, and what was like the landscape for you? What was the landscape for someone like that? Um, so I don't know what the landscape in general was. I, my my decision to go to Amsterdam was uh, was really based on the fact that I'd, I'd met at several conferences um, a, a gentleman called Professor Paul Karma, um, really really good Dutch guy, um, and we joked about the dirty chemistry that I was doing. Most of my PhD was working with uh, arsenic compounds. Um, Interesting. So he, he really liked that that kind of uh, dirty chemistry. And so that was that that got me invited over to um, an interview to for a postdoc. Uh, while I was there, I, I interviewed with Paul and I also interviewed with uh, the gentleman that was going to be my boss for two years, who was a, a gentleman called Professor Joost Rake. Uh, we got on really well with both of them, kind of had a choice of two different projects that I could have worked on. Um, but it was all part of the same group under um, uh, quite a renowned catalysis chemist called Pete Van Leeuwen. Uh, I really liked the setup. I really liked the group. Uh, it was just so phenomenally um, diverse in terms of country of origin. You know, p- the people there were just great. Uh, and so it just was a no brainer to go there. So I, I really only went for went for one one postdoc position and got it. Interesting. And uh, and so how, how did you actually get that that dirty chemistry, as you call it, interest in the first place? Did you, you like stumble into that or was that always your focus in your Ph.D.? Um, I think it well, it was it, it was very much always the focus of my Ph.D., but I think it's probably something that um, I inherited from my father, who, who was also a chemist and spent a lot of his his Ph.D. doing playing with some pretty nasty chemistry chemicals. So. When I then ended up playing with some pretty nasty chemicals, it didn't it didn't really feel too uh, too unusual to kind of the family line, as it were. Oh, got it. So you're you're uh, you come from a long line of chemists. Well, a second generation chemist, yeah. Nice, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so eventually, you moved out of the research and into communications. Um, were you? Can you kind of talk a little bit about? What shift happened where you, you know, stopped working at the bench and moved into the communication side of things? Sure. So uh, it's probably worth mentioning that my uh, that my father had, um, uh, with my mum, who was a PhD in biology, had, um, had, had been running a publishing business for most of my upbringing. So moving into communications wasn't necessarily a huge leap mentally for me at least although of course the work was very different but what what shall we say precipitated it was that while I was at I'd moved back to the UK I was working at the University of Sussex and while I was there there was a um, the university decided to try to close down the chemistry department and so there was a big fight by the chemistry department to uh, to say you know to, to save the department uh, something I was uh, heavily involved in I ended up um, being quoted in the Sunday Times along with my boss. Oh, wow. Um, uh, I did, did a little bit of political lobbying. So I actually spoke to um, Boris Johnson, the now prime minister, who at the time was the uh, the, shadow, uh, the shadow secretary for higher education. I love that. 
um, uh, spoke to a number of different um, uh, politicians as well, got invited along to a science select committee meeting um, and so was quite heavily involved in, in the campaign to, to save the department and that really helped shape um, my vision that there was something more than me trying to do the really heavy lifting of being, you know, working behind the lab, you know, behind the bench day in, day out. Um, I love science, still do, uh, but it takes it, it, it takes a special person to be able to really devote their entire life to discovery. Um, I realised that wasn't me and there was a different calling for me. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for people that can, you know, that can spend their whole lives uh, trying to discover new things. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, and, and I think, like, just from what you've told me so far about your, your work at LGC, which I want to get into, you know, I want to talk about um, how you led that e-commerce transformation. Um, but what, what kind of, what, what was your, you almost had a second career building experience over a period of years to kind of, you know, build your cred and, and build a good resume and, and credentials in communications and marketing. So um, what, what was that experience like, um, you know, going through your MBA and what was that de decision making process like for you? Sure. So once I'd left, um, once I'd left the University of Sussex, I worked through a number of science and business journalism roles where I would be talking to, you know, PR companies. I was talking to internal comms people and interviewing uh, very often the CEOs of, of organisations. So, um, you know, I was talking to the, the CEO of, uh, of Agilent a number of times. At the, um, yeah. I interviewed before he was um, the CEO of Thermo. I interviewed Mark Casper, who's now the, the CEO of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, and so I'd, I'd spoken with quite a few of the real heavyweights across the industry, been to big companies um, uh, across the, shall we say, life science tools providers, uh, pharmaceuticals and shall we say chemical industries and due, after the 2008 recession as we started seeing those green shoots of recovery as everybody um, liked to say at the time yeah I got I started getting really jealous of the companies that were you know being the real cogs of the of that recovery and I wanted to do something a bit different that led me to to go off and do an MBA and retool myself and upskill myself for a year and when I came out, I, I, you know, I kind of fell into the sorts of roles I didn't expect, but I had a different, um, different appreciation for them and how they fitted into the strategic landscape, which was to be, to move into more comms facing roles for a while. So I, I, I worked as a number with a number of different organisations, company in in the US called Artel, making uh, quality control uh, and and quality assurance instrumentation for testing the amount of uh, the accuracy and precision of volumes dispensed. Um, I worked with, you know, I worked in a PR agency where I worked with a whole host of tech and life science organisations, and and then from there, that was when I then moved into to LGC. Interesting. So you kind of you were almost building along with the current, you know, generation of leadership in the life sciences. Um, you know the people who are now the CEOs and and all that all that stuff. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, so, to to your time at LGC, I know you you went over on a call we had last week um, a lot of principles that you were mm -hmm. going over for like marketing automation and all that stuff mm -hmm. and how that fit in. Um, so, can you tell tell me a little bit about you know the overarching goal you had when you joined LGC and and what you ended up doing? Sure. So when, when I joined the organization, uh, the, I joined the genomics division and it was a little bit smaller than it is now. Um, it's been, the company's been quite acquisitive over the, the last few years and it's really made a um, really starting to make some real dents in the, uh, uh, shall we say, in, in the in the PCR and you know, genomics world. The the biggest. The biggest challenge I was given really was to understand the, the digital landscape, the that the organization played in. So what actual digital real estate do we own at the moment? Uh, that's because, partly because the uh, there hadn't been anybody owning the digital side of the business. There also hadn't been, you know, there'd been lots of different acquisitions. So website ownership was kind of spread out between different pockets of, 
um, shall we say, legacy businesses. And so it was my role to try to bring that together, understand what was there and define a route th- to the future. Um, That's great. I think what I think what attracted the organization to me was my ability to, to not only understand the tech, at least at a high level, um, you know, I'd grown up in publishing, um, having to code my own, you know, mark up my own pages in HTML. We'd had to do sure. a lot of, a lot on the web. And when I'd been Probably working way in agency, back in the day with like the old absolutely. school SEO and everything. Old school SEO before you had WYSIWYG editors and things like that. So uh, showing my age, um, even more than my hair would do. <laughs> and or lack of it, I should say. Um, but but also, you know, I've been doing a lot of installation of marketing automation systems, inbound marketing. And so really was pretty familiar with the, the whole marketing tech space. And so there was that side of it. I understood the science. I'd been playing in the genomics area for, for quite a while as a journalist. And so there wasn't, you know, while I wasn't, was never an expert there, um, at least in the terms of being able to do the science, it certainly was, uh, had, a, had a really broad overview of what was happening, what the trends were, what was important. Um, and then uh, you know, so you had those two sides, and then of course I had the communication side, which yeah, again was vitally important. Understanding what does a website need to do, um, and then with the MBA, of course, the the ability to understand what does a business need, how do you build a strategy, how do you look, for, you know, how do you really define a future, and then get the buy-in for that. So that was kind of what yeah, that kind of pulled on the different strings that I, I was I, I was then pulling on as I went through that role. Great. Yeah, I, I think I think you have a really interesting story because, um, you know, not only did you move from bench work to leadership, but um, I'm sure there's a lot of people right now who may have, have just completed their PhD and are looking at the job market. And a lot of them, I bet, have creative sides and have sides of them that they want to socialize and develop their communications angles. Um, so I, I almost I almost feel like that's going to be a lot more common now that we have so many opportunities for sharing all this content and stuff like that absolutely and I, I do feel that I was very lucky in that I mean as I you know as I grew up the internet was coming of age really um, you know it yeah. wasn't really until about the 2000s where you started having wi-fi starting to appear in various places mm-hmm. now, when I joined you know, when I started university we we were given email addresses but nobody really used them for anything uh, that's of course completely changed now to the point where people don't use email addresses because they're more interested in using something like slack or messenger or whatsapp for sure and so you see that transition where something that was quite alien 20 years ago now is so commonplace people aren't using it anymore or they hate they hate using email and if you look at kind of the maturity of some of the the distributed teams that someone like Matt Mullenweg from um, Automatic, yep. the, the company behind WordPress, you know, they've got a fully Austin distributed based. team. Shout out. Yeah. <laughs> Austin based, but they don't have any offices. They've got about yeah, 1,700 sure. uh, employees based all around the world. I think it's 70 yeah. countries. I think they're, they're based across. They don't own a single office space and they try not to use email. In fact, everything's, you know, trying to use what they call asynchronous communication on something like uh, slack or, or other you know other other messaging tools that allow teams to communicate uh, and you see that sort of shift away from or, or through different technologies to to communicate between people and it's just been so fascinating to watch and be involved with and and it's still changing day in day out um yeah you know i i just have to look at the the toolbar on my on my mac here and see the number of different communications apps that I have to close down when I'm joining a call like this. So I don't get notifications. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> that was like when I when I had took a little time to hop on the call, I accidentally shut off Teams because I was like, I don't need this. And then I was, you know, quickly realized, oh crap, <laughs> that's what we're doing this on. Um, and and I mean that that's very it's so true because I don't think we exchanged a single email besides um, sending you a calendar invite to get this entire thing set up, and that's just a mm-hmm. testament. To all that it's it's all been on linkedin and via you know via internet calls yeah. thanks to chris connor there you go networking 2020 absolutely um 
you know and that was that was great curated cocktails what a fantastic idea getting to meet me you know getting to meet yourself matt um yeah on a cool likewise. you know across the world and you know have a have a drink at whatever time of day it was and yeah i think it was like 9 p.m my time um, yeah yeah I, I and yeah for anyone listening who's in the life sciences or even not in the life sciences if you follow chris connor on linkedin big shout out um you can hop on his some of his networking zooms that are fun. Um, so, how much time do you have left? Because I got a couple more questions for you. Go for it. Uh, as much time for as you it. need. Awesome. Um, so, kind of circling back to the LGC and and just your leadership role there, as well as you know the knowledge you've gained. Um, what would you say separates marketing and growth in the life sciences compared to other industries or marketing in general? Like what makes it unique? Uh, so I think what makes it unique, uh, there's a couple of things that make it unique, but it's the uh, the biggest one is the need to communicate directly with scientists. Uh, you have decision makers that have very specific needs. Um, and, and, you know, the only equivalent marketplace out there or similar marketplace would be the engineering marketplace, but they're quite different. And really, that's because of the use value that people get from the tools that they buy. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, if you just take engineering, typically, if you go to any engineering magazine, you will see articles about the latest semiconductor chips, um, you know, the latest technologies being used in connected cars, things like that. But that those are tools that engineers are specifying to go into a product that's being developed. That's not something they really own. So while they while they while they definitely take pride in what's delivered, at the end of the day, these are small components that go into a bigger whole. Whereas in the life sciences, very often what the organizations are selling, you know, those magazines that, that the product pages in those magazines are very much about the products that you use day in, day out, the services that you use day out, the things that enable you to generate results. And so there's a, a, a lot higher personal use value for those products. Um, I have never witnessed, uh, I, I was doing some research during my MBA for uh, one of the, the largest life science organizations is in the world. And, you know, I, I was in a pharmaceutical company doing some research and we were looking at the usage of particular analytical techniques. And I have never seen such brand loyalty as an argument mm. between two of these yeah. gentlemen. You know, one sure. was a diehard Waters HPLC fan, the other was a diehard Agilent HPLC fan. And yeah. these two, you know, they, they respected each other as scientists. But, you know, if you've ever seen the old Apple Android fanboy arguments, that was nothing <laughs> compared with this. And I think that that just goes to show how much uh emotion gets tied up in some of those decision making to how much branding really does play a role in in the life sciences because people learn to trust the brands that treat them well that give them the results that get them where they are in their careers yeah and and do you think the foundation of that is because these instruments um they have such specific proprietary uses and um you know ways of being used is it is it that you know waters hplc might differ in the actual day-to-day -day functioning in, in terms of the knowledge you need to run it effectively um or do you think it's more of like 80 percent of the branding and the loyalty and the um, overall experience so sometimes it's the functionality but you can look at I mean, if you look at that that specific example, uh, yes, Waters had at one point jumped ahead with the launch of UPLC, and then Agilent came back with you know higher and higher pressure, ultra high performance LP, um, liquid chromatography, yeah. as they were calling it. And so at that point, really, there was the, the two the capabilities of the instrumentation was neck and neck. Um, it was, I think, that more it was down to the experiences that both of them had had and the years that they had had of implementing those different systems and once they sure. brought into a certain certain brand and developed the methodologies on those brands they knew them they trusted them and they knew how to you know they knew how to get out of them exactly what they needed and they also knew what was going to go wrong 
because let's face it any instrument is going to have a problem you know they need servicing they need looking for yeah but they were just so familiar with them that uh, they knew how to look after them they knew how to get the most out of them and that was really it and and those brands had also taken them to the positions that they had got to and so that's where i think the brand loyalty really sits in and you know they were they knew that the salesmen from you know the different organizations there was no issue there it was really just down to the history they had of them progressing their careers with that organization interesting this is something i see in our, in our company it's like from a marketing perspective the quote unquote bottom of funnel content is so so important compared to other industries like maybe software things like that where you know you get someone into a buying cycle you get them to subscribe, start your product, and then you have a library of resources and a support agent they can reach out to from time to time. But for the most part, you're just getting them over that finish line. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas here, the use cases can be so different and so intricate and technical that having a really robust support documentation, um, you know, technical documentation and availability, it's like so key. Absolutely. And also, I think it's the there's not just the technical support documentation, but also the ability to speak to somebody that's going to help you, that wants to help you, that's willing to um, that's willing to go the extra mile. And it's not just selling product. It's it's really helping transition a uh, transition, a, a process from being a concept through to a result. Yeah. So the reality is. In many respects, today, life sciences companies aren't selling products. Everything they're doing is selling a service uh, because all of it is in aid of something else. It's not like you're buying, you know, if you buy a pencil, you buy it, you know, you buy an item, right? But actually what you're what you're really doing is you're selling somebody the ability to yeah. to write. And it's that it's that transition that that I think a lot of life sciences companies have started to make in their marketing that really helps set them apart. Yeah, it's it's you know people's whole livelihood and in many cases their entire personal mission is hinging on this. One Point Solutions provides a free quote and design service for your laboratory furniture needs. We specialize in custom manufacturing and have the shortest turnaround times in the industry. Connect with us at onepointsolutions.com forward slash contact and speak with our design experts today. So this is a good little segue. Um, so so at LGC, you, you did lead like quite an organizational change and, and you've talked to me you know, separately about the legacy systems. You mentioned they were acquisitive and you had combined data silos. And, um, and so, so like you have really strong experience there and you've seen that firsthand, led it successfully. And I think we're in a time right now where, you know, trade shows have been decimated. Like the way people purchase, even in very technical B2B markets, is changing entirely. And and the way brands are rethinking content is, and data is changing entirely. So wh- what, would you, what would you say are your strategies for um, leading an organizational change? Well, I mean, that's, a, that's such a deep conversation that we could be yeah, here for hours. For sure. Um, but I th- but I think that the first thing is to look at what is the entire value chain of that of that um, of that change. Uh, if we just take a simple CRM in implementation, you know, let's say we'll call it simple, but it, of course, no implementation is is ever easy. You know, a lot of people will think, let's just install this piece of software, and we'll get the results. Um, of course. To, to get the results from the software, people have to be using it. So that means, okay, so then we need to add some training. When you do the training, you then realize that you need to get the processes involved, but you've still got to make sure you've got behavioral change to make sure that everybody's putting the right information into the system, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, as they, as they always say. So what you really need to do is to look at what is the entire business objective, get everybody to buy into the end goal. Um, paint that picture of what you're looking to achieve and why that's so important for the organization and then move that through that value chain and be able to help tell the narrative of how each of those individual actions really play a part in making the reality happen and and that's the that's the crucial thing it's about spending an awful lot of time with the key the key people that are going to help 
champion your cause um, across the across the piece. I think that's, yeah, that's really you, the key thing. What um, and so internally, when you're trying to get buy-in, if you if you maybe have a concept for how things can all come together, how you can shift. Um, did you ever did you, were you up against any challenges in terms of um, the internal workings of, of the companies you've been at? Uh, I think everybody always is. Right? Yeah. Any change is difficult. Um, I think the the key learning I took from that experience was to you know, the, to enable people to to be part of the solution. Mm. So that's not coming to them with, hey guys, I've listened yes. to you know, going out doing a, a load of you know a it's load a of principle. internal listening, and then giving them a solution. It's get them involved in the listening and then go away and work with individuals and get them to feel that they've put their mark into that into that plan yeah so you get them to feel that they're you know that that each individual has a stake in that being a success and then as you're going through the process yeah they'll still raise challenges as as, as intelligent people should but you want a robust plan and to, to, you know to be successful you want those challenges but you also want people to not just be shooting you down. You want them to be coming up with, okay, here's a challenge. How do we overcome it? And you, and if they then, if you then include them in solving any of those, that's how you absolutely move things forward. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of either alienate people or say this department's the problem, um, without kind of being more proactive about it. Absolutely. And if there is a problem in a department, you know, you feel there's a problem in a department, it's not necessarily the department that's the problem. It's the fact that that department is probably very busy, that you've not yet found a point of an alignment between what's important to you and what's important to them. And if you can find if you can find a, a way to align your priorities and show that you're, you know, show that what you're doing, you know, the, the, the you know, the project that you want to deliver actually is going to help them all of a sudden that gives them the impetus to help yeah that's great and you can only do that by listening and getting them involved i think listening is like the biggest skill one can have nowadays um in in more scenarios than one yeah i'm outside of business as well for sure absolutely um so one last like core area i want to talk about and this is something that um you've like enlightened me to a little bit previously is the idea of ethnographic research um, and like really leveraging customer insights, how people use products, how people use brands and how businesses can do that in a systematic way. So can you talk a little bit about um, your experiences with that? Sure. So so ethnographic research is really sort of using the tools developed by anthropology. And it's really about studying human beings in their own environments. So rather than just creating a you know, survey monkey survey, sending it out and and asking questions that you get a very yes, no, or you know, binary style answer to. What you're looking to go do is to go out and study people in their own environments. And you know, and probably the best the best example is going out and looking at what's important to an organization. So if you walk into an organization, you know, an office building somewhere, you know, you might as you walk in, you might see um the the car you know in the car park that you've got um designated spots for the ceo right by the entrance as you walk in if you have you got the the picture of the ceo meeting you know important politicians uh, alternatively you might have a car park where there's nobody um you know no mark spots you might, might walk in and on the walls are just the pictures of the patents or, you know, framed patents that they've been awarded. You know, so the first one you can tell is a very hierarchical organization straight away, very much believing in the cult of the CEO, as it were. And the second one very much is where, where knowledge is king and where patents are, um, are valued higher than anything else. And as you then walk through those organizations, there are key signs that you can see as to what's important to them what is um you know what makes them tick and therefore what are some of the key things about those organizations and then as you walk into the environment in which they're using your products all of a sudden you can start seeing how they're using things you can start seeing uh, how they 
how they're using them in ways that you never envisaged or that they're having problems that they're creating workarounds for. And you can start seeing really the truth about how people operate. And then if you even more telling, if you can ask them questions about what they're doing as they're doing it, any um, any differences between what they say and what they actually do shows a key point of cognitive dissonance, which is a key area for innovation in the future. Yeah, I love that. You can, so you all of a sudden you can start seeing what are those gaps and you can start, you know, and if those gaps turn up time and time and time again, um, you can, you know, you can really see that, that that's an, you know, an, an area for um, innovation. There's a really interesting um, example of that from a company called Miele uh, that, that went out, did this type of research and saw that there was a specific group of people that when they were, you know, vacuuming their floors, they would clean and clean and clean maybe 10 times they'd be going over the same spots Um, and when they dug into that and really started to understand it it was because the people generally were allergy sufferers and they didn't know whether something was clean or not so they kept going back over that same spot just to show that it was clean Mm. just to make sure it was Um, and so what they did was a very simple innovation was actually to to get a little detector that they could put into the um, into the you know into the vacuum cleaner itself, that would allow people to see when the dust had stopped. You know when there was no more dust coming off the carpet or off the floor. All of a sudden, that meant that they could they had an indication that the area that they just cleaned was clean and they could move on. Um, and that was quite life changing for it. You know, a group of people that were very very you know scared of getting you know dust allergies. Sure, and it's something you never would have known if you hadn't shadowed them. Absolutely. And so you can do you take that same approach into into the laboratory. That's why you're starting to see people having um, the ability to look at instrumentation remotely from a phone, make sure that things are still running. And if there if, if any if there are any problems, can I reset it? Can I operate that remotely? Because you, know, you might with automation, you might set up a process to run for 24 hours. Yeah. All you really want to know is that the process is working. Yeah, and, and um, kind of on this topic, um, it's not something I had sent you over or planned, but um, wh- do you see like a strong uptick in automation and virtual and kind of remote lab work in the next you know couple decades? Is that I mean, it definitely seems like almost a buzzword and uh, and something that is slated to blow up. But what what do you think is really going to happen there? So about. 10, 15 years ago, the the automated lab was a huge buzz topic. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was it was everywhere. People were creating, you know, massive combinatorial chemistry labs for drug discovery. Um, you know, high throughput screening was everywhere. And I think because people were just throwing almost any compound at any target and just trying to see what happened, you know, what, what came out, it kind of hit a bit of a snag and so people stopped wanting to to automate everything i think now where where we're getting to is a smarter level of automation yeah where we automate the processes that um are consistently the same where we automate those um uh, where we where we automate things that that make sense to automate but also that we that we don't lose the, the the subtle art of science, and I think that's a, there's a real um, uh, quandary that people have here is that people may have spent years learning how to, to to manually handle materials. You know, they're a very very um, you know science is a very tactile subject, and then very often it's an art form. Um, yeah. You know, crystallization of uh, of a pure compound. You know, you, you sit there and you've, you know, you've got your solution and you really carefully just layer on top of it a, another layer of solvent that it's not quite as soluble in. And you try not to disturb things. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, if you imagine that, that making cocktails and if you've ever seen someone make an after eight where you've got three layers of, of you know, different of different cocktails in there. Yeah. This is so much more. This is so much more delicate. Mm-hmm. And I think people 
enjoy that there's that people you know scientists are often drawn to the art of those of those yeah. processes and i so i think that there's a reluctance to lose that but at the same time nobody wants to be sat putting sample after sample through um, an analytical instrument yeah i think there's definitely like that muscular skeletal component of lab work you know mm. it's a physical activity as much as it is a mental one this mm. is the postures you do the muscle memory you know and so I think that there, there, there's, there absolutely is that 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 um, that balance. But I think for you know, let, let's just let's look at something like COVID nineteen and the, the the sample testing. Who wants to test every single sample by hand? If we're looking at trying to get a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand tests a week or a day, yeah, people want to run those on automated instruments. Yeah, for sure. It's no longer like a blanketed idea, but kind of using mm. it in a more deliberate way. Interesting. Thank you for for sharing that. No problem. I mean, I think um, it's this. There's, there's a whole host of stuff that you could dig into on sort of the future of automation. Yeah, um, but I think one of the most interesting ones, um, just just um, just to cover it, is is can you make it easier for people to uh, for the instrumentation that you're using to keep a track of what you're using in the lab and then help you reorder. So, you know, does it is it counting the number of plates you're running through it? Is it counting the number, you know, the amount of consumable, the number of pipette tips, it's, you know, the instruments used? Yes. If yeah. you start looking at those sorts of things, it can make your life easier because you're not having to maybe keep as much stock. It maybe allows you to, um, you know, have essentially an Amazon dash button on the instrument itself that says, hey, yeah, you're running out of this. Do you want to reorder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So kind of wrapping up here a little bit, I thank you for sharing all that. I mean, I've definitely, I'm going to come out of this with a lot of new ideas. And, and so the last couple of questions I want to ask, um, one is what's a book you've read recently that has had an impact on you? Oh, so probably the, the book, I mean, if we say recently, um, it's going to be a couple of years ago, but the biggest sure. book that had it, there was, it was a, a book by a gentleman called uh, Ryan Holiday called The Obstacle is the Way. Um, and meaning to read a, him at some point. A absolute must, especially now. He's, um, he's, he's fairly local to you, I believe, in, in Texas. So um, mm -hmm. uh, he absolutely brilliant author. Um, I, I've read, I think, everything that he's written. And he's a, a yeah, great guy. Uh, but that book was absolutely um, transformative in helping me see you know, the challenges ahead in a different way. Yeah, I, I know he's a big, like, in the stoic aspect, and he's a big, you know, collaborative Tim Ferriss. I see you got some Tim Ferriss back there on your bookshelf. I do, Tim Ferriss, uh, Ryan Holiday. Um, this is the book uh, itself. So there you go, The Obstacle is the Way. Nice. Um, the Ancient Art of Turning Adversity into Advantage. Uh, and it's been read by a number of, um, you know, sports teams as well. Um, huh. sort of helping them with their mental uh, you know the mental game uh, i believe including the, uh, the 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 patriots and a few others so probably well worth a, well worth Not a read surprising. for anybody that um that wants to look at challenges in a new way and finding those opportunities but interesting in cool awesome um and then what's a tool you've picked up recently that has improved your life could be like a peloton bike something in your house or maybe an app for work Oh, a tool. Um, trying to think of those. Um, the most recent ones, probably these 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 AirPods, actually, that just give me a little yeah. bit more freedom when I'm speaking on the <laughs> on a call like I this. I know. I was looking. I'm kind of like I'm, I'm jealous. I think I might need to invest in a pair. Um, I've got a I've got a mic set up separately that's connected, um, but having that freedom to move about a little bit and not feel yeah. that I'm tethered to something um yeah, certainly nice. it's a, it's a nice feeling what's uh what kind of mic are you using um i have a blue yeti nano awesome yeah you sound pretty pretty nice quality it's going to come out better than this this little guy um awesome so so just to wrap it up if, is there anything that you want to share or promote um if there's anything i want to share or promote um wow uh yeah so i I've got a, I do a number of things. So if people want to come along and see what I do, I work, you know, my, my business is called Striven. 
um, S T R I V E double N, and go to striven.com. Um, I'm a I'm a member of a life sciences well the life sciences part of uh, a, a marketing agency called Up There Everywhere. Um, great website and a, a really great group of people for that you know really enjoy working with. Um, so feel free to check those two websites out. And you know if anybody's thinking about studying and doing. Um, uh, you know any sort of training in, in in management or leadership then check out Cranfield School of Management I'm a visiting fellow there attached to the uh, Center for Strategic Marketing and Sales and um, yeah really really good school and you know you never know I might get to to give a lecture or be a supervisor for some of your work so <laughs> whether that's nice. a positive or a negative I don't know yeah. but uh, you know, always good Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you giving your time. Thank you so much for the invite. Really appreciate it.